If you were asked in the system design interview, how would you design a system for highest availability? What would you say? Or better yet, which design choices would you make and why? I'm Fabian, the Big Tech Coach. On this channel, you find all tips, knowledge and resources you need to land your dream job in Big Tech. Why does availability matter? It's really one of those hidden champions of system design. You barely recognize it's there until it's not anymore. You probably have never seen a website like Amazon or YouTube being down. And that's because the companies running those websites do want you to be able to access their content 24 seven all year long. That's the usability aspect of availability. But there's also a more brutal aspect of it, the economical side. I looked up a fairly old number to be fair, but it actually says that on average, every minute a system is down costs the company running it 5,600 US dollars. And that's an average value. That means Amazon or YouTube being down is way more expensive for sure. Let's have a look at availability in numbers. Typically, when you want to determine how available a system is, you speak about how many nines it got. And look at the 3-9 system. This is just down for about 9 hours per year, but the associated cost with this downtime is insane. And that makes it quite clear how cloud providers can charge a high price for a guaranteed availability of 4 or 5 nines. But the customer value is not the only reason why a guaranteed availability is that expensive. To build a system which actually can guarantee this degrees of availability is very complex. And now we're going to go and see why this is the case. Systems that can guarantee a high level of availability are enormous networks of computers that are interconnected and they handle thousands of write and probably even 10,000s of read requests per second. And the more machines you do have in your system, the higher the odds that some of them will eventually fail. And not to forget the network by itself. It's notoriously unreliable. So what is the design patterns you can actually apply to get your system to a, let's say, 5-9 degree of availability. Let's go into the two design patterns I want to show you today. They're almost no-brainers. They're widely used to increase availability. So let's get into them. On the left-hand side, we're going to talk about failover, which is very interesting for a broad range of components within a system. On the right-hand side, we're also going to talk about replication, which is mostly interesting for relational databases. The idea of the failover pattern is pretty simple. It's all about how do we shift load from one failing component to another component which can take over that load so the system is not going down just because a single server has to restart. First, we look at the active-passive pattern. And as you see, we do have two servers in our system. One is actively handling requests from clients while the passive server just sits there. Both servers are connected by a heartbeat. So the passive server knows once the heartbeat stops, the active server has gone down for some reason. And the passive server now has to become active. Now the problem is, there is downtime associated with this process. First, the heartbeat needs to be detected to be off, and then the passive server has to take over. And depending on the state, if it's a hot or a cold passive server, this can take more or less time. Anyways, this is not the most favored pattern for designing systems with high availability. So don't spend too much time in your system design interview preparation on this pattern. The next pattern we'll look at is way more interesting and gonna help you a lot in your interview. This is the active-active pattern. And as you can see, 
here you don't have a passive server which needs to first of all recognize that the active server has been gone down. You simply do use a load balancer by default to route the incoming requests to all your available servers. And this might look familiar if you already have watched my video on scalability. And the big benefit of this pattern is that you don't have a downtime when one of those servers goes down as the other server can instantly take over the traffic. I have to admit load balancers are a topic on their own and there's a video coming out soon about load balancers. I'm also going to cover a couple of other important components within system design. So if you're interested in learning more about those, just subscribe. Now it's time to talk about the second availability pattern, the replication pattern. And this pattern is widely used and it's so massive, there's so much content around it that it actually deserves a fully fleshed video on its own. But today we're going to do the short version so you get a broad overview. And it's mainly concerned with the problem that stateless services scale very well because you just spin up more instances. But if you have stateful services like database service, there you need to make sure they are all in sync eventually. Think about it. If you would buy something on Amazon and you buy it and then after that the item is out of stock. If the database which stored this information and the counter of the inventory is now zero and the other databases wouldn't sync in time, then there wouldn't be hundreds of other users which probably buy the same item and well, it's not in stock anymore. It's not owned by Amazon. It probably doesn't even exist. So that should make clear how important it is to sync your databases. And one of the ways you can do that is replication. Before we go into our first pattern, I need to say, if you start learning about databases, everything is relative. So you're never going to find the perfect database, the perfect pattern of replication, because it always depends, just as a small disclaimer before we go in. The pattern we look at is the primary replica pattern. And this one is defined by the idea that we do have one primary database server which accepts only write requests. And then there's replicas who accept only read requests. And what we basically do thereby is we split up responsibility. And there's a couple of advantages and disadvantages related to that. There's a couple of advantages and disadvantages to, related to this pattern. On the one hand side, it's really fast and there's no restrictions on the performance imposed by it. You can also split your reads in a logical way. So you might have a replica which only is responsible for analytics queries or something. On the other hand side, and if you have watched my video on scalability, you do have a problem with your primary because you can't scale it horizontally. You can only scale it vertically. And that means that you only can add more capabilities to your single machine. That means you're gonna buy more RAM, you're gonna buy a more expensive and powerful CPU, and you can do that for a while, but eventually you're gonna hit a ceiling where this is not economical to try to get the most high-end machine to do the job. And at the same time, also your primary is a single point of failure. So if this one goes down, you do need to promote one of your replicas to be the new primary. And that is not an easy task for sure, I can tell you. But more on that later in a different video on databases. This is all for the primary replica pattern for now. And let's look at the second pattern I want to show you today which tackles the problem that you can't scale your primary properly with this pattern. The primary primary pattern is a real alternative to the primary replica pattern we just saw. And what you see here is that we do have database servers which all accept read and write requests. And this is good in a sense as 
that we can now scale our database service horizontally. We can just add more and more service and we don't have to go all in into the high-end components, high-end CPU, high-end RAM. So this is really helpful. And it also is helpful in a way as if one of those fails or multiple, we do have other servers with the right, same rights available to just take over the load. No problem with that after all. On the other hand side, however, we do have the problem that we talk about asynchronous replication here. That means that we write to one of those database servers and it will take a while till the other database servers are actually receiving the replication of that state. That means there's a couple of problems with that. For example, if the one database server goes down, my last write request was processed in and it hasn't been replicated yet, this change to the state just disappears. No one knows about it anymore. So there are going to be wrong states in the system. All right, so asynchronous replication also has the problem that if we create backups of our different servers and they haven't all synced, which is most likely, that we do have backups of our application state in multiple backups and they all represent a different state. So another problem introduced by this asynchronous replication is related to backups. Think about if all your database servers create backups on their own. And the more servers you have, the harder it's going to be to keep them all in sync. So eventually, you do have multiple backups of your application state and they all look different to a certain extent. All right, so think about it. You're now in your interview situation. You have a recruiter staring at you and you need to come up with some way to make sense out of everything you learned today and somehow talk about availability in the context of the problem you got. And as a first step, clarify the use case. That means ask questions around what is the system being used for? What do you think it's intended for? And especially do some quick calculations of how many users you expect. If you have to design the parking lot system, for example, scalability is not as much of a problem as if you need to redesign Uber or something. So this gives you very detailed information about what kind of patterns might make sense and which you better not suggest. Next step, you do draw out your core architecture and leave out all the fancy things, just focus on the core features you need to make this system work. Once you have done that, it's way easier to identify bottlenecks and show where it wouldn't scale the way you drew it. And then you can actually shine with not just talking about scalability, but also about availability and how much of a sense you think it would make to go for the one or the other pattern in terms of scalability, but also obviously in terms of availability. And there, for example, you need also to, to talk about how you would leverage those patterns you learned today. Failover, where does it make sense, where it doesn't make sense. Replication, what kind of databases you want to use. And don't forget the why, the how, fair enough. This is the engineering part they expect from you, but the why is what they really care about. And you can also say, because I said, as I said before, there is always a trade-off. So you won't be able to make the perfect decision, but you can argue why you would go with this or that approach for now. I hope this was helpful to you. If you want to learn more about how you can prepare for your system design interview or any other technical interview, just subscribe to my channel and there's more content coming up on everything you need to actually nail your coding interview and land your dream job at any of the big tech companies you always wanted to work for, even Google.